The next bill on the calendar of the day is House File 1077. The clerk will report the bill. House file number 1077, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to housing, the second engrossment. There are amendments at the desk, but if there is no objection, we'll defer to the author to explain the bill before taking up the amendments. To the author of the bill, the member, uh, Chair Hausman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Having a safe and stable home is the foundation for well-being and achievement in nearly all other areas of life. Lack of stable housing has negative impacts on economic security, on health outcomes, and educational achievement. This bill provides funding to a variety of programs aimed at helping produce more affordable housing in Minnesota, as well as provisions to ensure Minnesotans are safely and stably housed. More than 572,000 Minnesota households pay more than they can afford for housing. That equates to more than one in every four households in the state. A household is considered cost burden when they pay more than 30% of their income for housing and severely cost burdened when they pay more than 50% for housing. The Housing Omnibus Bill was put together with a focus on supporting Minnesotans throughout the housing continuum, there's much to do, helping people find secure and stable housing to prevent homelessness, increasing the amount of affordable workforce housing statewide, and increasing access to home ownership for all Minnesotans. We know that's what builds well. The Housing Committee received a target of 30 million above base, most of that being one-time funding. Obviously, um, that's not enough for the crisis we're facing, uh, but we uh, tried to target as much as possible. Uh, the following programs were funded over base. Uh, the Challenge Program, Manufactured Home Park Infrastructure Grants, Workforce Home Ownership Program, Homework Starts With Home, Bridges, which is the rental assistance for individuals with serious mental illness, homeownership assistance fund, homeownership education, counseling, and training, local housing trust fund, the naturally occurring affordable housing grant program, lead safe homes, and shelter provider task force. There are a number of bills that we incorporated into the omnibus bill that specifically focus on bringing balance to the landlord-tenant relationship. We have not done much of that work in the past. In Minnesota, evictions move quickly. We I'm are sorry, Chair Hausman, just a moment here. It's getting a little noisy in the chamber and hard to hear. We're trying to turn up the audio, but if members could keep their discussions to a minimum until we get the chamber audio turned up. Thank you. Okay. Chair Hausman. Um, Minnesota evictions move in Minnesota. Evictions move quickly. And we are one of only seven states that does not require a notice before filing an eviction. 43 states do better than we do. There are also a few measures related to manufactured homes, which provide some of the most affordable ownership opportunities on the market. In addition to the bill's funding to improve park infrastructure, it also includes titling reform provisions to make it easier for owners to access traditional mortgage financing, as well as Representative Bernardi's opportunity to purchase bill, which gives people who own manufactured homes the opportunity to purchase the land their home sits on when it is put up for sale to try to prevent the land from literally being sold out from under them. They own the homes, but they do not, under, uh, um, do not own the land underneath. Most of the homes being sold, most of the home parks being sold are being sold to out of state uh, purchasers. And we've noticed that that's where the rents are higher as well. So that's an affordable kind of ownership. The other one that I'll hold up is naturally occurring affordable housing. NOAA is the acronym. Uh, testifiers told us in committee that if we can find that, it's half the cost of, uh, of new if we had to uh, construct new. If we can find it and save it, before uh, developers um, buy it and improve it and raise the rents. There's also a section in here establishing the Lead Safe Grant Program, which would seek to test for and remove harmful chemicals from the paint in homes all over the state with a particular focus on areas where children experience high rates of lead poisoning. That's primarily in homes that are 100 years old. This is a bill that Micah has been working on for years. I suspect you've heard from some of their members. I'm proud to include that piece in this bill. While there is so much to celebrate about the work Minnesota does related to housing and home ownership, 
we know that outcomes in these areas don't look the same in every community. Minnesota has one of the worst racial disparities in home ownership in the country. The programs and policies contained in this bill make critical investments to help close the home ownership gap, to prevent displacement, to ensure evictions don't unnecessarily block families from affordable housing opportunities for years. Once that is on your record, it's hard to find another place to live and to make sure homes are safe. I'm going to just mention one other program because it relates to other uh, departments that you will see and how all of these issues interconnect. Homework Starts with Home is a grant program conducted in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Education, the Minnesota Department of Human Services, and the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness. It supports collaborative efforts between schools, housing organizations, and local governments to identify, engage, and stabilize students experiencing homelessness and their families. The University of Minnesota has done uh, research. By the time a child reaches fifth grade, if they've been homeless or highly mobile, they're achieving at the level of a second grader who's in stable housing. That's the, that's the interconnection of all of these things. Madam Chair, that is the, Madam Speaker, that is the bill. There are amendments at the desk. Representative Lucero offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. Lucero moves to amend House Bill number 1077, the second engrossment. The amendment is coded A8. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Lucero, who will explain the amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Housing providers in Minnesota work very hard to provide high quality housing. Unfortunately, as we know, housing providers have been enduring hardship over the last year with eviction moratoriums and other issues. Most may envision how housing providers are large companies with deep pockets, but the fact is many housing providers are individuals who own just a handful of rental properties while also working their nine to five jobs. Uh, I have spoken to many that are in this category. One such was one of my constituents, a single mom, who called me up just a few months ago, and we had a conversation where she described the incredible hardship she was enduring uh, with the eviction moratorium in the second house that she owns and the inability to pay uh, the mortgage because of the tenant that was occupying her rental property and she was unable to, to uh, pay the mortgages when, and was facing uh, foreclosure. So again, uh, it is many, many people that own just a handful of rental properties. A provision currently in state law hard codes the interest rate that housing providers must pay on the security deposit that they are holding for their tenants, and it's hard coded at 1%. However, the national average interest rate for checking and savings accounts has been well under 1%, near zero actually for over a decade. And so what my amendment seeks to do is to remove this 1% hard-coded interest rate in statute that housing providers must pay uh, to tenants on the security deposits. And my amendment is actually very similar in spirit to a bill, uh, House File 1950, that Representative Ryer has uh, uh, ref, uh, on the topic of individual deferred annuities that we heard in the Commerce Committee uh, several weeks ago, that in recognizing that interest rates are well under 1% and have been for many, many years, uh, in this bill, it's, it's also hard-coded at 1% in state statute and uh, bringing that down to 0.15%. And so again, this is just simply uh, an amendment that recognizes the reality that interest rates are not uh, high, so certainly not above 1%, and that landlords, small landlords like my constituent single mom, is having, there's no reason why uh, she should be having to pay uh, a percentage that's well above savings and checking accounts uh, on the, the uh, security deposits that she's holding for her tenants, uh, as well as many other small landlords across the state. So, Madam Speaker, and uh, I'm hoping that your houseman would take this as a friendly amendment. Discussion to the amendment. Madam Speaker. The member from Ramsey, Representative Hausman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I actually do uh, request a no vote on this. Um, I always, of course, appreciate when a bill gets introduced, uh, especially in the area of housing, 
we have this great partnership with all of the advocacy groups. Homes for All Coalition now has, I, uh, I think, over 273 groups around the state. And as a new idea is presented, we always consult and have discussions with the advocacy groups. But uh, in this case, there was not a bill on this. How we have tried to help uh, renters and, and uh, landlords is through the housing assistance program. $100 million has already gone out the door. Uh, in the House, we, in our bill, we said we want that, that money to go directly to the landlords because we want them held harmless so they keep safe and uh, warm and stable housing for everybody. Um, and so um, uh, and now we have another, I think, 300 million coming from the federal government that will be there similarly. We're still um, working on how to get that out the door as quickly as possible. And again, holding landlords and renters harmless during this difficult time. But um, for today, I would, uh, this, this still is the uh, tenants, these are the tenants dollars we're talking about. So uh, today I would request a no vote. Further discussion to the amendment. Seeing no further discussion, all those Closing in favor. Remarks. Madam Speaker. Oh, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And that's very unfortunate. Uh, that being the case, I would uh, request a roll call. A roll call having been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I will just close with this then that uh, I, being a housing provider myself, very small potatoes uh, among my, my peer housing providers across the state who are, again, having just a handful of properties, I work very hard to do everything I can, bending over backwards, to give this security deposit, the full security deposit, back to my tenants. I've had tenants that have been with me for seven, eight, even close to a decade. And uh, in many of these cases, again, it's, I do everything I can to return the full security deposit. But the security deposit that's been given to me as many of my small uh, uh, landlord or housing providers, uh, I have to pay interest then above and beyond. So imagine a security deposit, $1,500, you know, five years later, I'm giving them back more than they initially gave me. And I'm actually, uh, this is money that I've lost now in terms of uh, the security deposit because I was now nowhere near making 1% in holding their money in a savings and checking account, checking account. So while uh, it's unfortunate that Chair Hausman is uh, not going to support this now, we need to recognize reality that landlords should not be expected to pay uh, an interest rate on a security deposit that's above the market rate. And so members, I would hope that you would agree and vote green on my amendment. Thank you. Further discussion to the amendment. Seeing no further discussion with a roll call having been requested, the clerk will take the roll on the A8 amendment. Those that are voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? <laughs> Thank you. 
Baker. Baker votes aye. Baker aye. Berg. Berg no. Berg no. Davids. Davids votes aye. Davids aye. Fisher. Fisher votes no. Fisher no. Frazier. Frazier no. Frazier no. Frederick. Frederick votes no. Frederick, no. Gomez. No. Gomez, no. Grossel. Grossel, aye. Grossel, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Lily. Lily. <laughs> Lily. Lily, no. Liz Lagarde. Liz Lagarde, no. Liz Lagarde, no. Mariani. Mariani, no. Mariani, no. Marquardt. Marquardt, no. Marquardt, no. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. McDonald. <laughs> McDonald, yes. McDonald, I. Mueller. Mueller, aye. New Brindley. New Brindley, aye. <coughs> Olson B. Olson B, aye. Olson B, aye. Pearson. Pearson, aye. Pearson, aye. Pinto. Pinto, no. Pinto, no. Poston. Poston, aye. Poston, aye. Pryor. Pryor, no. Pryor, no. Sandell. Sandell, no. Sandell, no. Sandstead. Sandstead, no. Sandstead, no. Sundin. No. Sundin, no. Thompson. Thompson, no. Thompson, no. Zhang J. Zhang J, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Tice moves to amend House File Number 1077, the second engrossment. The amendment is coded A7. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Tice, to describe her amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, this is a housing omnibus bill, and there certainly is an issue in rental housing. One of the things I'd like to talk about first is what this amendment will do, and it'll phase out the eviction mor moratorium. But most importantly, it works in 30, 60, and 90 days, and it phases out not the, f the folks that are not being paying their rent, but it's also allowing the landowner, the housing provider, to help them find assistance. And I want to let you know that there is a website that Minnesota has put together. It's the renthelpmin.org website, and it really has a lot of information for both renters and, and housing providers. As MHFA prepares to release the $295 million in rental utility assistance in the federal bill. As a reminder to date, with the new federal funding, the CARES Act, 100 million, and state funding, we have provided over 400 million in rent support over the past year. A moratorium on evictions can cause ripple effects that further hurt local economies. There is a more efficient way to help renters, and we have been doing this. Give them the cash that replaces lost income, while also supporting small businesses and local governments. On March 27, 2021, Boyce Olson released, had a release that said data shows no eviction wave coming. And I have been looking into this quite often, and we're not seeing the eviction wave that some of us have been hearing about. He also, the, the release also stated that leaders should avoid dramatic statements and rely on data. 
Rent checks do not just line the pockets of fat cat landlords like we hear about. They also contribute to essential government services and other workers' wages. If many households are simultaneous, simultaneously unable to pay rent, the economic impacts will be felt throughout the local economy. Where exactly does a rent check go? It goes to property taxes, which helps our city and county government. Mortgages, which helps our banks and non-bank financial institutions. Insurances, it goes to utilities, which means water and sewer providers, garbage collection, gas and electric. It goes to maintenance, so that we can take care of those different projects that need to get taken care of. It goes to management fees, if there's a property manager. It goes to capital reserves. And this is something not many folks think about, but capital reserves is a fund for major re maintenance and upgrades. It's something that we have to constantly be in mind with. And then, finally, the housing provider and investor have profits. Or do they? Housing providers or equity investors have to pay when they don't have enough money to pay the rest of it, or at least figure out how they're going to get that. The first entity that gets paid by a monthly rent check is not the housing provider, it is local government. Property taxes actually have a higher priority than mortgages. Mom and pop housing providers who own small apartment buildings are especially vulnerable. Mortgage payment, property taxes, and insurance account for well over half of the property income. And we all know that corporate taxes were do due on the, on the 15th, and we do have time to space out uh, for those folks who are smaller people and they roll that income into their personal stuff. We have until May 17th, but guess what? Property taxes are also due on the 15th of May. According to According to the eviction lab, Minnesota's eviction rate is fourth lowest in the U.S. Among large cities, Minneapolis ranks 201st, 201, St. Paul is 217th, and Rochester is 225th. While concentrated areas of certain concern remain, Minnesota's eviction rate fell faster and farther than the country over the past decade. I'm concerned about the language where the courts can, can, de can determine that an eviction action is no longer a reasonable pre predictor of future tenant behavior. If the evictions were due to unsafe behavior, I, as a housing provider, need to be aware of this. We are, sto we are stopping any chance of conversation regarding these facts. Our lease agreements are the first step in creating partnerships between the two parties. We look, need to look at ways to encourage that dialogue, not discourage it. I am very encouraged that we will be looking into ways to have those discussions. Right now, we need to be cognizant of the struggles all parties are having and find ways to work together towards the goal of affordable and safe housing. Madam Speaker, I would request a roll call, please. A roll call having been requested, there will be a roll call. Representative Howard. Madam Speaker, I rise uh, under Rule 3.21, motions and propositions must be germane and I have advice. You're offering a point of order? Yes, yeah, point of order, Madam Speaker, yes. Thank you, thank you, Representative Howard. Yes, please state your point of order. Uh, my point of order in row 3.21, motions and propositions must be germane. Uh, the Tice Amendment adds a new section of law that is not present in the bill, thus it expands the scope and is not germane. I do want to comment, and I appreciate that Representative Tice is bringing uh, a motion about the eviction moratorium. I think that on this side of the aisle, we also recognize a need, excuse, excuse me, for a legislative solution uh, to the eviction moratorium in a way that prevents a wave of evictions. And the House has a bill, House File 12, it sits in Ways and Means. The Senate has passed this as a standalone bill as well. Uh, and this is so important that we do believe that this should be taken up. And will be taken up uh, as a standalone bill, not as part of an omnibus bill. Uh, but I, since uh, Representative Tice did bring up the eviction moratorium, I do want to call out that uh, it has saved lives in Minnesota. Uh, a study of other states that dropped their eviction moratoriums revealed tens of thousands of deaths. Uh, 
uh, as a result of dropping their eviction moratorium. We need an orderly end of the eviction moratorium, one that respects renters, Madam respects Speaker. landlords, and we will be Madam doing Speaker. that. I hear a voice. Uh, Representative Howard has the floor right now. And so, Madam, Madam Speaker, Speaker, I would rule order. that this is out of order. Thank you. Madam Thank Speaker. You. Yep. Please state your name and for what purpose do you rise? Representative Greg Davids. Repre and Representative, Representative Davids. Rep Representative Howard was clearly out of order. He had a point of order. He made his points, but then he went on to some long speeches. Let's keep our point of orders as point of orders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative David. After reviewing 3.21, I find the point Madam of Speaker. Of Rep Representative Howard's point of order well taken. Representative Madam New. Speaker, was I not allowed to give advice to the body, to the speaker? Representative I was New, standing I to be recognized the entire New. time. Representative New, I don't have to seek, I do not have to listen to advice. I can rule on a point of order. Well, Madam Speaker, no I appeal the ruling of the speaker. And I request a roll call. Representative New re appeals the ruling of the speaker, and there has been a roll call saying 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative New. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I, I just want to point out and, and, and point out that this amendment is in order, and I would just be very cautious. We are at the beginning of hearing our omnibus bills, and we're creating a strike zone here. Uh, and, and if this amendment is ruled out of order and is not germane, we have now created a strike zone that I do hope will be followed as we bring these omnibus bills forward. Uh, you know, I, I know that Representative Howard has an amendment coming up tomorrow that is absolutely introducing a new topic. And so I hope that we will find this amendment to be germane so that we make sure that in this body, in this chamber, we are consistent in how we apply the rules. I, I would urge members to vote against the ruling of the speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, speaker, Representative Winkler. Oh, Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The A7 amendment fits squarely within the landlord-tenant law and eviction law as found in Chapter 504B. It also addresses manufactured home parks as found in Chapter 327. In a bill that addresses eviction proceedings, eviction expungements, and manufactured home park law, this, um, this amendment is in order, and I would encourage members to vote against upholding the rule of the speaker. Thank you. Further discussion, I see Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I just wanted to echo the, the comments of uh, Representative New Brindley uh, in my high, great concern for the strike zone continuing to be narrowed here. In fact, when I observe the, the continued narrowing of the strike zone, it, it becomes more and more, uh, to me, the, the shape of a plow. And I certainly, with the number of omnibus bills that we're going to be discussing over these next few days uh, into next week, that uh, it might be much faster to simply accept a vote on some of these amendments. I know that you may not like them, but let's just vote because I would hate to have a plow-shaped uh, strike zone continuing to take shape. Thank you. Further discussion, Representative Howard. Madam Speaker, I would encourage a yes vote. I want to be clear, this uh, adds a new section of law, Chapter 12, dealing with emergency powers. Uh, that's not in the omnibus housing bill, and so I would encourage members to vote yes to uphold the ruling of the Speaker. Further discussion. Seeing no further discussion, I will remind the body that the question before the body is, shall the decision of the speaker stand as the judgment of the House? A yes or a green vote supports the ruling of the speaker, a no or a red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. Having been a roll call requested, the clerk will take the roll.
those that are voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? Baker. Baker votes no. Baker, no. Berg. Berg, aye. Berg, aye. Doubt. <clears throat> Doubt. Davids. Davids votes no. Davids, no. Fisher. <clears throat> Fisher votes aye. Fisher, aye. Franzen. Franzen. Yep, Franzen votes no. Franzen, no. Grossel. Grossel, no. Grossel, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, aye. Katiza Watoon, aye. Lily. Lily, aye. Liss Lagarde. Liss Lagarde, aye. Liss Lagarde, aye. Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Marquardt. Marquardt, aye. Marquardt, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. McDonald. McDonald, nay. McDonald, no. New Brindley. New Brindley, no. Novotny. Novotny. Pearson. Pearson votes no. Pearson no. Pinto. Pinto aye. Pinto aye. Poston. Poston no. Poston no. Pryor. Pryor aye. Pryor aye. Rasmussen. Rasmussen no. Sandstead. Sandstead, aye. Sandstead, aye. Sundin. Sundin, aye. Sundin, aye. Thompson. Thompson. Thompson, aye. Thompson, aye. Zhang J. Zhang J, aye. Doubt. Novotny. Novotny. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 61 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the decision of the Speaker shall stand. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House file number 1077. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. The member from Ramsey, Representative Herr. Madam Speaker, members, I stand in support of the Housing Policy and Finance Bill, House File 1077. I want to first say thank you to Chair Hausman, Vice Chair Howard, and staff for the time, energy, and effort put into this bill. Though housing has one of the smallest budgets, that does not mean housing and the issues that lie before us in housing are small. Many of you have heard me say this before, but I believe it's worth repeating. Housing sits at the intersection of the disparities that we face in economics, wealth, education, jobs, and health. If someone doesn't have safe and stable housing, they cannot secure a job, they can't build wealth, kids can't study and do well in school, and people can't manage their health. 
Owning a home is harder now than it was for my refugee parents 40 years ago. Affordability, supply, and financing create challenges to the dream of owning this asset, generating wealth, and passing it on to subsequent generations. Not only is owning a home challenging, but access to affordable housing for those who choose to rent is also difficult. During this unprecedented time, the pandemic has made it all the more important to protect tenants and address Minnesota's outdated tenant landlord laws, which have not received serious revisions for decades. As it relates to House File 1077, I'd like to speak to four specific provisions in the bill. The first is establishing a statewide heat code of 68 degrees between October 1st and April 30th. Reforming emergency repairs and bringing emergency repair court filings in line with small claims court filing from $300 to $70. The second is prohibiting surprise fees and leases and clarification of reasonable notice for when a landlord needs to access a tenant's home for non-emergency issues. The third is termination of lease upon infirmity. This allows renters to break their lease with ample notice if a physician certified condition, illness, or disability makes living in their current housing a health issue. The last relates to eviction, expungement, and pre-eviction notice. It requires the courts to order an expungement for reasonable circumstances, such as when a defendant wins their case. The case is dismissed. Parties have agreed to expungement. If an eviction is more than three years old or the case is settled and the defendant fulfills the terms of the settlement. As for the pre-eviction notice, a 14-day notice to tenants is required before an eviction is filed. The provision provides landlords the same standards Minnesota already, Minnesota already requires of tenants when a landlord fails to respond to a written uh, repair notice before they are allowed to file a lawsuit. These are really important provisions that are needed in our housing to reform laws that have not been looked at for decades. These provisions are just a part of a really great omnibus bill. I am proud of the work that we did in this committee and I ask for your support of House File 1077. Thank you. The member from Blue Earth, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I rise in, in opposition to this bill today. Um, this, uh, I, I served in the Housing Committee last session and uh, we had a lot of healthy debate about housing issues and especially landlord tenant law. I've spent 27 years in real estate um, as a real estate agent and owning properties and renting them out. Um, I've never been a, a massive landlord, but I've always owned some rental properties and I know a lot of other people who own one or two or three rental properties. Uh, it's an investment a lot of Minnesotans make. Um, we wouldn't be sitting here as a legislature writing hundreds of provisions to penalize restaurant owners and bar and some of these businesses that have been hardest hit by the governor's executive orders uh, in the state the last year. But we're doing that today. This bill it just really hurts people that have housing that they've been renting. They've been suffering because there's been tens of thousands of Minnesotans that have not paid rent. We've had a, a congresswoman from the cities who's been promoting people to not pay their rent. Um, the governor put an eviction moratorium on and then prevented the property owners from uh, from taking the the thousands of dollars that came from the federal government. Um, people went out and, and bought durable goods instead of paying rent because they weren't required to because the governor was saying they didn't have to pay. And we have a lot of people who have tenants that haven't paid in over a year. I've heard from property owners whose tenants applied for the grant money that the state was giving out to get caught up on rent and they didn't qualify because they made too much money. We have a major housing crisis in this state because of the eviction moratorium, and that's not being addressed in this bill, except for to say property owners won't be able to find out who's being evicted, which is a very important decision in determining if you're going to rent to someone if they're already being evicted from the property they're in now. This bill also allows evictions to be expunged from people's records after they've after the courts found them to be uh, in violation and have to move out. And they can expunge the record if the previous landlord just agrees in writing that it could be expunged. Well, doesn't that create an incentive for tenants to then uh, not pay their rent, be evicted, and then just go back to the previous landlord and make a deal with them to give them half or some of their rent that past due in order to sign a piece of paper to get an eviction? It, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to just 
create more and more evictions as we have people out there who are in taking advantage of this of this law. What people in the housing committee had a hard time understanding last session was the cost of rent is simply just a collection of what the cost of maintaining that property is, including vacancies. Vacancies are a real cost. And property owners don't want to have vacancies and they will work with pro well, they will work with tenants for a long time to keep them in their properties because that's having someone there is is the best way to keep your property maintained and this 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 bill also goes through and uh, basically discriminates against people who have illnesses and severe allergies to animals by requiring that uh, that pets not just, now we're talking about service animals. We're talking about companion animals be allowed everywhere with, without the property owner being able to ask for a larger security deposit because an animal of any size uh, can be allowed in the property. And I don't want to talk about, you know, companion animals that are ponies or, uh, you know, animals that aren't dogs, but, this bill doesn't really clarify that either. There are people that have severe allergies and look for properties that are uh, that are that are free of that of of dander and have been, you know, have a history of not having pets. And this bill doesn't uh, doesn't provide for that. There's there's so many provisions of this bill that are bad, but overall, I just want to say that property owners across the state have had a really hard time because of the executive orders the governor has put down with this eviction moratorium. And this bill just kicks this industry when it's down. We have a problem with tenants that actually can't afford rent and we need to figure that out too. Uh, but this bill is uh, completely one-sided uh, to, to, to hurt property owners. When we've seen the policies in St. Paul now with a major property development for affordable housing that's been rejected. Um, there's a lot of conflict. It seems like you want housing and then you don't. Um, I think we need to work out a better balance between landlord and tenant law, and this bill does not do that. Um, so members, I'll be voting no, and, and I would encourage you to, to also vote no, and we need to fix this bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. The member from Hem Hennepin, Representative Ag Badge. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Today I rise in support of House File 1077, particularly to the provisions that relate to tenants' rights. So I'm really glad to see that this bill will update Minnesota's laws as it relates to the eviction process. In many ways, Minnesota's eviction laws maintain the same structure as when they were created in 1858 when Minnesota became a state. One aspect of that is that unfortunately Minnesota is one of the states where an eviction can take place in as little as 10 days just after filing. In just over a week, a family's whole life can be turned upside down. As we know, an eviction makes it harder to find new housing, more likely that a family will end up in worse housing, or possibly with no options at all. This is all detrimental to a person's physical and mental health, it makes it hard to keep a job, and it harms children's performance in school. With this bill, we have an opportunity to make the court process clearer, less chaotic, more helpful, and more humane. We know eviction comes down hardest on Minnesota's struggling families, and the data shows that black women are more likely to be evicted than any other group in Minnesota. As an attorney myself, who has volunteered with the Hennepin County Housing Court Project for more than three years, I've seen firsthand how destructive evictions are to families. I frequently counsel people who fall behind on rent and who just need that extra time to apply for emergency assistance. But at the speed at which our courts can hear and decide on eviction matters, that often prevents that. If this bill becomes law, tenants and landlords would have the time to find a meaningful solution and not have to go to the court as often. Updating the eviction process will help prevent unnecessary displacement of Minnesota families. Some of the updates to this bill include adding seven days between summons and the first court appearance, and it also adds 10 days between the first court appearance and trial. And this allows tenants to either make a payment plan with the landlord or seek legal advice. 
This bill also requires more information in the court summons so tenants know exactly how they may have breached their lease as well as where they can seek additional resources. Finally, this provision will make eviction filings a non-public record until a judge makes a decision where the landlord prevails. The vast majority of landlords will not be affected by these changes since many of them are doing the work to prevent evictions. But when eviction does happen, these updated processes in this bill will create a more just system for all parties that ensures due process and helps them to understand their rights. These changes will go a long way to stabilize housing for many families across Minnesota. So I want to say thank you to Chair Hausman, thank you to Vice Chair Howard for working in, with our whole committee to put together this bill. Because of the significant investments in building new housing, preserving affordable housing, providing funding for more people to own a home, and protecting the rights of tenants across the spectrum, we are taking the critical steps towards the goal of ensuring that every Minnesotan can have a place to call home. I urge members to vote yes on this bill. The member from Dakota, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Today I'm proud to stand in support of House File 1077, which helps Minnesotans across the housing continuum maintain self safe and stable housing situations. This bill reflects our shared value of caring for all people in our state, taking important steps to ending racial disparities in access to housing and home ownership. It also shows a commitment to being responsible stewards of state resources. Loss of housing is a root cause of many, many problems with health, education, and ability to keep a job among them. These are expensive and traumatic and have lasting effects. With housing investment, we stop them before they start. I'd like to speak to just a few provisions. Uh, one of the most direct ways to help people be in a home is through rental assistance. Bridges is a rental assistance program that provides housing subsidies to people living with serious mental illnesses while they're on the waiting list for federal Section 8 housing assistance. The program is available in 70 counties and the Leech Lake, Mille Lacs, and Boys Fort Tribal Nations, and certainly currently serves over 800 individuals and families. Nearly one third of Bridges recipients are households of color. I'm pleased that this provision, which I carried as House File 1860, matches the request from the Homes for All Coalition and the National Alliance on Mental Illness in Minnesota. House File 1077 also includes a set of provisions that help bring the landlord-tenant relationship into a better balance. These are common sense steps that simply ensure fairness and bring clarity to requirements for both parties. For example, Representative Hassan's House File 20 ensures that a proper notice has to be given to tenants if they're gonna be evicted. Common sense, a minimal expectation and note Minnesota is one of only seven states that does not require any notice to be given to tenants at all. As you've heard, Representative, uh, Representative Agbaje offered House File 1060, which extends the eviction court timeline so people have more time to understand the process, assemble a reasonable defense, and plan next steps. Right now, it only takes about 10 days from filing to trial. Members, this goes fast when you haven't even received notice of your impending eviction. And Representative Richardson carried House File 450, which provides a right to counsel for people in public housing who have an eviction filed against them for reasons other than non-payment of rent and which tend to be the more complicated cases. Uh, there are other provisions, including these by Representative Herr, which allow termination of lease when a tenant has to enter hospice care or a nursing home. That's House File 400. And another that provides protections for potential tenants from surprise fees hidden within a lease in House File 399. Members, these are not radical steps. They simply rationalize the processes. As a renter myself, I appreciate the protections they offer. And while I have an excellent landlord now, I've experienced the problems that can come with an unscrupulous or uncaring landlord. And while these are the exception, we simply must ensure that Minnesotans are looked out for. I want to close by thanking Chair Hausman for her leadership and committee this year, and thanking all of the staff for their dedication and hard work. 
We have put together a bill that everyone can be proud to vote for. So members, please vote green on House File 1077. Thank you, Madam Chair. The member from Madam Carver, Speaker. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Home, that's a great word, home. Very powerful word. It says that you've got not just a building to go to, but you have a place where your people exist and they hang out and they support you. They love on you, they help you with a bad day, they help you celebrate a great day. Home is a powerful word. And I think of my own kids, I have six kids, I have two of them out of the house, that's a good thing. But I, the two that are out of the house have said on a number of occasions in different ways that they view our home in Waconia, a physical address, as sort of their North Star. That if something goes wrong, if something bad happens, they can always follow the North Star home. My kid in the Navy who's in Japan right now deployed, he says, Dad, I know that I can always count on you and mom and our family and our home to be there to help me when I am in a, in a tough spot because he's doing his job in the Navy. Home is powerful. And I will tell you, uh, Chair Houseman, that some of the things in here I, I really do appreciate and I, I see tremendous value in those. And I'm glad that you have put them in this bill. But this is a housing bill. And I believe that it fails to address some of the fundamental issues that are impeding other people from having that ability to have that North Star for their family. That are in the way of people who want to start off in a, a, a starter home in pick a place here in, in Minnesota, but in my district, maybe it's in Mayer or Hamburg or New Germany or Waconia or Cologne or Victoria. Many of the things that we face in our housing crisis are not addressed in this bill, and I'm, I'm curious as to why. Certainly in the housing bill, you would think that we could address some of those issues. Certainly in the housing bill, you would think that the author would want to talk about the impact of zoning or the impact of land use, the impact of the cost of permitting, the impact of the cost of home inspections. And I asked the chair that in ways and means, but I, I will ask Madam Chair or Madam Speaker if the chair would yield to a question. Representative Hausman, will you yield? Yes, I will yield. She will yield. <laughs> Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Chair Hausman, you and I uh, both share a passion for housing. And you articulated a distinction that I've got from where you are in ways and means the other day. But I guess my first question is, you know that my position on housing as one of the pieces of a large quadratic equation is perhaps zoning and land use and the cost of permits and the cost of inspections. And I asked you about those things. But in your housing committee, did you hear anything or hear, have any hearings about those particular issues at all this year? Representative well, we Hausman. Uh, I'm, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, we certainly have heard uh, and had attachments up to uh, on committee agendas uh, from all of the city groups that have, have weighed in. Um, members, I will say that there are some uh, who believe that if we just cut regulations, codes, and fees, that uh, developers could build affordable housing. Uh, my dilemma with, with spending too much committee time on this is the more time we spend on one aspect of the housing continuum, market rate development, that's what this is, the less time we spend on addressing the needs across the entire continuum. Here's what cities believe. Cities believe that development should pay for development rather than turning to property tax, taxes. So for example, if costs borne by the cities, permits, inspections, and mostly infrastructure, if those costs borne by the city are not paid by the development, those costs are passed on to existing property taxpayers. Cities estimate that those local costs are from 3% to 7% of the sale price. The biggest drivers in this area are land costs, labor costs, and construction materials. 
So that's um, the context in which I have dealt with this. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I guess the answer is no, there were not hearings about those impacts. And I will tell you, Chair Houseman, again, I look at this as a large quadratic equation that we all did in, in various uh, levels of algebra, but there are a lot of different integers into solving this housing problem. And as a former mayor, I appreciate you saying that cities say this and cities say that because when I was a mayor in the city of Waconia, we talked about this. And I will tell you, one of my fundamental disagreements with you is that you say uh, development should pay for itself. Well, guess what? It does. When we were plotting and platting different developments that were going on in the city of Waconia, guess what? The developers paid to have infrastructure brought out, they paid to do certain things, and then they had those people who would move into those homes that were built on that piece of land pay for that development. So please don't think for a minute that development does not pay for itself. The chair alluded to a group, as she calls it, a small group of people who believe that building our way out of this is the solution. She minimized them in committee, and I will tell you this. I have spoken to hundreds of people who are in the housing industry. Now, housing industry doesn't necessarily mean those people who swing a hammer or those people who pour foundations. It is a lot of the following. It is people who work to put appliances into the home. It is people who work like my best friend, the guy I spend a lot of time fishing with, is a tile contractor. He is impacted by the inability for people, Madam Chair, there's a little noise in the chamber. He is impacted, his livelihood and the future of his family is impacted by our inability to build homes. We have a pent up demand for starter homes. We could build, according to many, up to 50 to 100,000 homes if we, one, had the labor, if we, two, had the ability to develop in such a way that people could have their starter home built, they could build the home that is that first North Star for their family. But we can't because of many of the impacts that are being brought forward, and I really wish we could have addressed this in this bill. I have worked on this since I arrived at the Capitol years ago because I, I have the insight of a mayor. I recognize that decisions that were made in city hall chambers have an impact on people who are trying to buy a home. You make a conscious decision to have nothing but very, very large homes, that's what you're going to wind up. If you make a decision to have a requirement to have certain types of facades on the outside of the home or certain things inside of the home, that's going to change the price of that base product. We've learned from the realtors, both nationally and here in the state of Minnesota, that for every thousand dollars you add to the cost of a home, you are effectively pricing 4,000 people out of that marketplace. So every dollar spent in zoning, every dollar spent in permitting, every dollar spent in fees adds up. And if you carry that forward in your mortgage for 15 or 30 years, it has that compounding effect and it winds up making it so that you're paying more and more and more. But back to the chair's comment of folks who are, uh, I believe in other times I've heard that they are uh, cherry picking data. Well, here's a source that I found very interesting, and I can't say that any of us would believe that this is cherry picking. This came from the Wall Street Journal today. April 15th, 2021, 7, 0, 7 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time, the Wall Street Journal said that there is a roughly 3.8 million single family homes short of where we need to be nationally. Here in the state, let's use the number between 50,000 and 100,000 houses that could be built so that people could have that North Star. The Wall Street Journal writes, the shortage is especially acute for entry-level homes, which makes it more expensive for first-time home buyers to enter the market. The chief economist said that from Freddie Mac. So certainly that's not cherry-picking things. 
The article goes on to say that in February there were a two-month supply of homes for sale, which is a near record low, according to the National Association of Realtors. I will tell you based on the studies that I have done here in the state of Minnesota and the data that I have received from not just this, as Chair Hausman said, narrow-minded group of people or narrowly focused group of people, I'll correct that. I've talked to realtors and I've talked to, to uh, builders around the state and they are trying to solve the problem by building homes. They want to do that. So we have to really consider what are the impediments. And I'm not saying that solely building more homes or solely addressing the issue of permitting or different costs that I've articulated is the only solution because I'm not that short-sighted. I do recognize that some of the things that are in Chair Hausman's bill do have an impact and I'm pleased to see them moving forward. But anybody who says that the things that I have as concerns are not important enough to either have a hearing or to talk about are similarly myopic as to what you're accusing me of being myself. It is a complicated, complicated equation. It's one of those ones that when you're taking that algebra test in college, you're like, oh crap, this one's gonna take a long time to solve. Yes, it is. But you cannot discount or dismiss the impact of decisions simply because some of your allies with the various city organizations say, oh no, no, it's fine. It's going to be okay. Nash is bad. Not many of you may believe that, but that's okay. You have to address the totality of the situation and you have to be willing to say, I'm okay with having a conversation about decisions that are made at county boards and city hall chambers and township sheds have an impact on how this all comes out. To get there, we have to have the tough conversations. We have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm willing to have that conversation. I'm willing to have a hearing. I'm willing to listen to a bill. I've offered up a number of bills. You know how many of those got hearings? Zero. There's another part of the, the equation. We have to be able to create that healthy market so that people can find that place that they want to live. I got a couple calls uh, over the summer. I got a couple of calls most recently. The one that I'm going to share with you, I'll, I'll share two stories with you. One is from a person who uh, moved to my district. They said, Representative Nash, I love it out here. But we had to fight to find a home. We would go and we would put in an offer on one home, and next thing we know, there's a bidding war going on. And it's going up and up and up and up and up. That would have been a lot better situation if we would have had more inventory. Another good friend of mine has a daughter who is now a single mom. She posted to Facebook the other day a picture of her and her son with a sold sign in their hand. She was so proud. You could see the smile was literally ear to ear of her and her son who was on her shoulders. They had bought their first home. They had created that North Star for them. but they had to fight to get the house because the inventory is low, the demand is high, the regulations are steep, the red tape is thick, and sometimes it's just really hard to get done. And that organization sometimes that gets poo-pooed has done some great research in the last number of years and has compared and brought forward the data on the impact of regulation as it relates to housing. And they did a side-by-side -side comparison of the cost of a home here in the Twin Cities and looked at that same home, the exact same home in parts of Wisconsin. Twin Cities housing was way higher, tens of thousands of dollars higher. Same home, same build, same everything, higher here in the Twin Cities. Help me understand that. Because I, I've tried. I've tried to figure that out. It doesn't make sense. We have to do better 
and I am, I, I am upset at the morphology of this bill because it does not contain any of those things that we should be talking about. We have not had one single discussion. You heard it from the chair, said, oh, we've talked about things, but we've never had a hearing. The last biennium we had a subcommittee uh, on housing, Representative Fisher was the chair and Senator Housley was the revolving chair when it went back and forth. We were talking about these things. Why are we not talking about them now? The need is bigger than the last biennium. The impact is larger and greater and more dire than ever before, but we're not having the conversation. That's sad. And the things that the chair has talked about are effectively some subsidies. We cannot subsidize our way out of this problem. You know, I heard the chair say, well, in, in ways and means that she was excited that they could find ways to do tiny houses and that tiny houses were going to solve some of the housing problems that we have. No, it won't. There's no way you can build tiny housing developments at scale to make an impact. She talked about a, a concept of having like a, a, a hotel that I stayed at in Norway. You had your bedroom, but the bathroom and other facilities were outside of that. So that's sort of a, a housing solution that she offered. Now that may solve the problem, but it's for a very small number of people. The engine of housing has to also contain the conversation around how are we allowing builders to do the job that they want to do on the land that the developers own. Developers buy land. There's one going on in my, my, my district right around the corner from me. A friend of mine has finally sold off part of his farm and it's being developed as homes. The person that owns that land should have as prominent a voice in how that gets developed as the municipalities do. And this is in the city that I'm the former mayor of and I'm glad to know that they are taking it seriously. But many cities aren't. And it's okay to admit that sometimes cities get it wrong. The default position should not always be in defense of cities. There are some good cities and there are some cities who are getting it wrong. That's okay to admit. But it's our job as the policy creators here at the Capitol to address and ameliorate those problems. And just blanket denial and defense of a, of a default position of people who are getting it wrong is not how we solve those problems. Home. I, I think that home, again, is a supremely powerful word. My wife and I have been in our home uh, for 20 years now. And we know that the impact that that home has on our kids is greater stabilization of the family unit. It's greater stabilization of creating those people who live there and grow there and move out from there, that they are a more stable human being who can go off and do great things in the world, like join the Navy, serve your country. But we are always home. We are home base. We are that North Star. And those people who live in those homes and invest in their communities, their coaches, their mentors, they're that reliable person who you can always count on to come and give you a hand. They are the person who will invest in their community financially. You know, in my community, and I'm sure in a lot of years, we have a lot of. Um, play structures and other things that were built and paid for by people who volunteered to give that into the community. Right now there is a, an inclusive playground that is being built in my community and paid for in my community by the people who live there. That's what you get when you have people who can be stable in their home and invest in their community. So Madam Chair, I cannot support your bill because I think it is not enough. You haven't provided an opportunity for all of those people, for lack of a better phrase, who are shopping for their own North Star to find it. We have to address the inventory issue and subsidizing it is not the issue. We have to let the economic engine of home builders do that. 
And I want to remind you again that it's not just people who swing hammers and the developers who own the land. There is a huge adjacent market, and a lot of them are in my district. I have another friend who owns a cabinet company in the city of Cologne. He's always looking for people, and I was pleased to be able to refer one of my other friend's husband into that business. By the existence of that company and the strength and stability of that company, he was able to hire somebody else and provide greater stability for them. But if we eventually wind up not being able to service the market demands, we're lost. We're lost. So I, again, I appreciate some components of this bill, but it just comes up too short. There are no North Stars in this bill, and that's sad. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hurtas. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I wasn't going to speak about this at all because I know how it's going to end. But then as I've been listening to the conversation, I felt I had to speak up on an industry that's been very good to me. You know, members, in Minnesota, we are able to boast a home ownership rate that far exceeds the rest of the nation. In fact, for the last five years, with the exception of 2018, our home ownership rates have exceeded 70%. Now, since the early 80s, I have spent my life in being a housing provider. I've created homes to your exact specifications as a custom home builder. I've worn the shoes of the developer developing land for our own company as well as other building companies. I've owned an engineering company that did the platting and design and engineering of the projects. And I can tell you firsthand some of the impediments that are involved with regards to actually creating affordable housing. And I've touched on these over the last several years, many years. In fact, as a freshman, I came here and I was assigned to the housing committee. And can you hear me, Madam Speaker? And Representative Hurtas, we can hear you, yes. Thank you, I had a uh, icon in the middle of my screen that said to unmute myself, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, you know, I, I've seen some rather curious things going on here for the last nine years uh, here in the Minnesota legislature. Um, during the great housing crisis and as a reaction to that, I saw all sorts of actions being taken which were good spirited in the hearts of uh, servant legislators who want to protect their constituents, but many of the actions being taken actually contradict the supply of housing. For example, during the great uh, housing downturn and the rise of mortgage foreclosures, there was all sorts of legislation to impede mortgage foreclosures and to actually actions like that would restrict the access to credit and the mortgage market in our own market. In addition, I've seen such onerous things, you know, being proposed during that time where people who owned houses that were rental houses, if they were vacant because they were for whatever reason, that cities were imposing fees as a vacant house. Uh, I think Minneapolis or St. Paul was one of the worst of them, uh, imposing a fee of $7,500 if a house remained vacant. You know, members, uh, regardless of what happens with the actual construction and housing industry, one thing doesn't change, and that is that our kids continue to grow, they mature, they go to college, they get an education, they marry, there's household formation, and all of that continues regardless of what is going on in the housing market. And we are seeing right now the culmination 
of really uh, market forces working against us, a housing recession, household formation that continued to rise. We've had land use policies that are extraordinarily restrictive in terms of creating available land. And we've also seen during this time a consolidation of our local housing market, which was unique in the Midwest, has been getting greatly consolidated into national home building companies, those big evil corporations that so many of you despise. So a lot of these practices have really worked uh, against the housing industry. Now you've heard Representative Nash speak about fees and things that go on that uh, drive the cost of housing. And I also am a member of Ways and Means and I've heard the chair uh, and author of the bill here uh, say that uh, she doesn't accept the premise that that is going to uh, lower costs. But I do need to make you aware of the things that are having impacts on housing. Uh, not too long ago, I developed a project in a northern suburb, about 80 or 90 lots. Um, I remember having to battle City Hall on all sorts of issues with regard to what the market is. That community said, we don't want any affordable housing. We want expensive homes. Uh, one of the ways that they did that is to make the development before you build a house very expensive. One way you can do that is you can mandate $7,000 light standards on each corner you can uh, dictate the minimum size of the lots and you can lower density. And obviously when you're talking about different ideas that sound so wonderful, and a lot of these urban planners have all these great concepts like tiny houses with great open spaces, community gardens, but guess what folks, it comes down to density. You still have to divide the total amount of land into the number of units that you are not being able to build, but being allowed to build on. Let me qualify that. I mean, I made comments in Ways and Means. If I came into a suburban ring and wanted to propose a 50 lot subdivision like I grew up in the St. Louis Park and create some affordable housing, certainly that would be within the reach of a lot of middle class families. They'd laugh me right out of, right out of town. Get out of here, Hurtas. We don't want any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, the, the housing building industry is really quite a challenge. And it, like I mentioned, we've got a paradox of, of things coming together at bad time. We've got increased demand, household formation by young people who are wanting to start families and buy homes. But we still have a problem uh, with regard to the, the home ownership rates among minorities. And I also own a real estate brokerage, and I can tell you one of the big handicaps you struggle with with a lot of young people uh, and a lot of people who are trying to raise families is you don't have two incomes. And household fragmentation is a whole other subject, but it's a real big issue. Uh, trying to purchase a home with a lot of long-term debt and the lack of financial acuity in terms of understanding that there are certain things you need to do first before you start taking on long-term debt with regard to installment notes on cars and automobiles. There are priorities, but once you have that home, you can start to access the equity that you build by home ownership and you, you grow wealth uh, in your home. And Representative Nash talked very passionately about what homes are. Homes shouldn't be regarded as an investment, but nonetheless, they end up being one of the major assets in every family's uh, portfolio in terms of building wealth, because eventually by the time the kids are gone, the mortgage is soon retired, and uh, you start accumulating some wealth and you position yourself for a more comfortable retirement. So, you know, when you're, when you're developing land, uh, like I mentioned, if you can afford to live here, then we're happy to have you. That's the underlying current I've seen as a developer with a lot of communities and attitudes of people just like you and I who sit on city councils. 
They worry about crime and adverse elements and what's going to be coming to our suburbs. So we just make the projects expensive. That's one way to keep people out. So zoning is an issue. Expensive landscaping, entrance monuments, making them all pretty, that all adds to the cost of the home. So this bill in particular uh, has many assaults on private property rights. And again, in a very attempt to create an alternative form of affordable housing, safe housing, we all agree that having a home is a good thing and having a safe place to go to is necessary. There's 46,000 folks who live in manufactured homes on different types of manufactured home parks. And some of the proposals you're putting forward is certainly going to end the parks as you know them. You're certainly not going to encourage the growth of any of them. And it is a real violation of the real, Realtor Code of Ethics to be disclosing any of the terms or conditions or price of a transaction before it closes. That's confidential information. And you're proposing to require uh, prospective agents to disclose stuff that the, the Realtor Code of Ethics says you don't do that. You can't do that. It's been some years since I joined the legislature says I've been actively building homes, but I'm still developing land and creating opportunities for other builders. More on the transactional side, I'm going to be doing a project in my own community this year. But I'm also seeing the increase resistance and pressure, the things we have to go through, the hoops you have to jump through, the multiple layers of uh, water jurisdictions and reviews and fees that have to be paid, trunk area charges, laterals. Uh, I mean, it costs millions of dollars to build a project. Uh, so much that it's become more attractive that I'm working on projects in two other states rather than here at home. Uh, it just makes more sense. So I'm telling you firsthand that you can't ignore some of the things that have been talked about here this afternoon. And, um, you know, it's my desire uh, that everybody can own a home. We all know that homes create stable neighborhoods. And in the real estate community, in the brokerage community, we know that nearly two-thirds of all home buying decisions are made with schools in mind. And we have uh, a track record of investing pretty well compared to other states in our schools. So we have a lot of good reasons why people maybe should want to own a home uh, in our communities. But all of that said, you know, it's, it's just troubling to see the perpetual lack of acknowledgement of what is going on in the industry and, and the culmination of increased costs and prices and not being able to talk about some of the issues that go on. Another northern suburb, uh, when I would walk in to pick up a building permit, uh, it was an also a, an additional $2,500 fee just to pick up a water meter that costs $110 in other communities. You know, these, these types of, of creative ways to create revenue for city budgets has always been on the back of uh, the development community. There's been proposals by those who advocate uh, affordable housing to use one of the tools and the toolbox of requiring all new plats to come in that have to have 10% 10 per, 10 of the lots maybe have to be affordable housing. Well, guess what? Um, when you talk about tools in the toolbox like that, you're basically saying that in order to make that lot affordable in maybe a, a middle or high end neighborhood, you've got to burden all the other lots with the cost of that lot. That means you're asking every other person who buys a home in that project to subsidize someone else living in the neighborhood by paying higher prices on the cost of their lots. Lastly, uh, with regard to the burden of new development, we talk about 
roads and lane improvements and things that have to be done. And largely those things are negotiated in the approval and planning process of any new development. But what is often lacking from the argument is the refusal to acknowledge all of the tax capacity that's being added on into this community by building a whole new neighborhood. Millions of dollars of new tax capacity, which benefits counties, school, local government. So it's a false argument to say that housing doesn't pay for itself. We know that it does. And when we have vibrant, growing communities, what that also brings is more commercial business, which helps lower real estate property tax rates based on our complex property tax system. When you, when you have a customer base, then the business will follow. So no matter what your attitude is about growth and development, it's going to happen. It's going to continue to happen. And the responsible way is to manage that growth and to manage it in, a, in such a way that you can welcome it and mitigate any of the negative impacts. But with that, Madam Speaker, there, there's no way that I can support this bill with the language and particularly the, the things that are going on with regard to, uh, I, I'm, despite the fact that I build custom homes and, and develop land, I think that mobile home parks are a wonderful way for uh, people to get started who, who do not have the scratch to put down on purchasing a new home or maybe don't have the credit, but it allows them to build equity and to make that life cycle step in housing that is available to so many people. And some people just like living in a, in a park like that and find it very affordable and based on their income, they can enjoy a lot of other things that other people with higher incomes do because they don't have a disproportionate amount of cost with regard to their housing. So you've heard enough from this guy uh, about development and housing and I'm gonna yield the floor, but thank you members. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker for listening. Um, some of the communities that uh, I was referring to on the north side of town, uh, I think you uh, live up on that side of town and so I, I won't mention names, but um, we can do a lot more. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, thank you for the good conversation here tonight on this housing bill. And uh, I want to thank um, Representative Nash for articulating some really good um, points about the fact that there's nothing in this bill to address the rising home costs or to make housing more affordable. And I'd like to address a little bit about the mandates that are in this bill. And most of you in this chamber know that um, my husband and I are housing providers and at one time we owned 80 to 100 units and now we have just three duplexes. Um, but I just wanted to address some, some problematic parts of, of this bill from the standpoint of housing providers and how this bill is going, if it would ever become law, which it won't because the Senate is not going to go along with these provisions, but how this is actually going to make um, uh, housing um, even more um, uh, I guess rare and more difficult to come by because what you're going to be doing is forcing housing providers out of out of the market. They're not going to they're not going to um, want to put up with a lot of these mandates. Um, one of the things that um, is in this, I believe it's in this bill, maybe it's in another bill traveling, um, but just um, the requirement that um, housing providers um, uh, must must not discriminate against people based on their income source. And uh, I can tell you from personal experience in the various properties that we've owned that these inspectors come around for Section 8 and other types of housing. And you can get one inspector, um, you can get five inspectors from the same county and they all find different things with your property that you have to do. Um, and they're never on the same page. They all have different requirements and it's expensive. It's expensive, um, and we keep good properties, but they find little nitpicky things. Um, and um, there are some other issues there. I, I don't think that the government should be telling um, housing providers um, who they have to take 
as far as um, people that are going to be living and occupying their property. That's the decision for the housing provider. And um, members, one of the other problems with this bill is the extension of, there's a, the 14-day notice ahead of, of having, uh, before the person is, t uh, before the expungement, or not the expungement, I'm sorry, the unlawful detainer is, is filed. And I can tell you, we have worked with any tenant that is willing to work with us, um, if their car broke down and they had car repair expenses, if they lost a job or their hours got cut back, we are more than willing to work with people. We don't want people to move. It's expensive for us, and we've bent over backwards for people, particularly that have kids in the home, because we know how stable housing um, is important to those families, and we don't want those kids to have to be uprooted. But at the same time, um, we have a mortgage to pay on our properties, and so we need to collect the rent so we can pay our mortgage. So this 14 days added um, on top of, of um, a notice you probably already have in your lease. Our, our lease says that rent is due by the 5th of the month, and if you haven't paid by the 10th of the month, then you're likely to have an unlawful detainer filed against you. So we're already giving them, and many landlords have that same policy, they're already giving them some lead time to add another 14 days and then wait for the court date to get in to actual court. You're going to, that tenant by that time is going to be another month or month and a half behind in their rent. So you're not doing people favors. And the final, um, item that I'd like to address is, is the, uh, the mandatory expungement. Um, and members, one of the things that we try to do is we try to make, um, you know, a safe and stable environment for our tenants. And I can tell you that if we can't see if someone has a criminal background, when we do the background check, um, you're putting not only, I mean, we're going to have to take on the liability potentially of somebody that could come in and harm other people that live in the same, in the same um, complex or in or the other side of the duplex. If you have somebody that comes in and their, their property or their record was expunged, but let's say they were stalking a woman that lived in that building, in the building where they lived several years ago, and then they move into your building and they start doing the same thing. That's what you're creating here. You're creating a less stable environment. Um, and I will say too that when we look at a rental application, we look at a person's income, their ability to pay, and put a lot of stress on, on what their past rental history is with their prior landlord. Were they good renters? Did they pay on time? Did they destroy the property? Did they follow the other rules in the lease? So those are things that are really important. And if we aren't allowed to find those things out before someone moves into our property, we're, um, there's a really good likelihood that we aren't going to own that property much longer. If we, and members, what, what I'm concerned about with this bill, with the mandates for, that you're placing on housing providers, is that you are going to discourage private ownership of, of, of housing. Um, and we know that the government doesn't have a particularly good track record in owning rental property. And so members, I, I can't support this bill, and I would ask members to vote no. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hassan. Madam Speaker and members, I rise today in support of House File 1077, the Housing Omnibus Bill. I first want to thank uh, Chair Hasman, Vice Chair Howard, and our great, wonderful housing team for their hard work and dedication to solve the housing crisis or put at least a couple puzzles in this piece to uh, help Minnesotans who are struggling with housing issues. For someone who represents a district that has its 86 percent renters, you can understand my passion at, to housing and why I care about eviction laws being reformed. <clears throat> 
Research indicates that housing supports better educational outcomes and improved life chances for young people. Folks who live in stabilized housing are the ones that result in living in healthier, happier, and safer lives. Stable housing promotes labor mobility and the growth and productivity of our state's economy. It provides the circumstance to build saving and financial re resilience to meet life's challenge. 2020 has thrown many surprises at us. A pandemic that took many lives, confined us to our homes and shut down our economy. When the governor announced a shelter in place, we had thousands of Minnesotans who have no place to call home. We also had thousands of Minnesotans who have lost their jobs and were unable to pay their rent and mortgages, buy their food for their family, and continue to provide for their loved ones. If it weren't for the eviction moratorium in place, we would have 10,000 Minnesotans out on the street. As we all know, evictions are not COVID-related issue only. We had thousands of families struggling with evictions on their record prior to COVID. According to research, the people facing the highest risk of evictions are people that look like me. They're low-income women of color, followed closely by families with children and domestic violence victims. Families who are evicted uh, regularly lose their possessions, lose their jobs, and experience higher rates of depression. And to make it this matter even worse for children, the instability caused by evictions can result in worse outcomes in education, health, and future earnings. This bill has many great provisions addressing the home ownership gap, shelter appropriations, affordable housing funding, housing assistance, and of course, updating our eviction laws. Representative Nash talked about that we don't have enough, um, we're not building enough homes. I do agree with you. We're not building enough homes. But I have a house file for that. I'll send you the house file number and you can sign on that. We have 60,000 families of color who are mortgage ready in the state of Minnesota and cannot find home to purchase. And Minnesota leads the nation on the worst home ownership gaps between whites and PIPA communities. Eviction provisions in this bill are imperative to keep families housed and safe. The provision that people echoed on the 14-day notice that they have concerns is actually one of the things that I'm very excited about. Did you know that it takes 21 days for Hennepin County to process emergency assistance, and that's prior to COVID, and Ramsey County 14 days? If someone lost their job today and they applied for emergency assistance in our two biggest counties, they would have to wait 21 days or 14 days to get assistance for their case to be processed, not to get assistance. So this 14-day notice will allow families to apply and use that 14-day that, um, day notice letter to maybe process and speed up their uh, cases. This legislation gives folks more time and appropriate, uh, to find the appropriate needed assistance before an eviction is filed. It's a fact that eviction is costly and it impacts families and individuals negatively for many years to come. So it's my understanding that we're avoiding the filing of eviction in the first place and finding common ground between landlords and tenants. The eviction is punishment re reform. When I first came to this, um, body in 2019, it was one of the uh, legislations that I carried. We had people that came and testified, and they had evictions on their record from the year 20, 2000. That was almost 20 years. They didn't even know that they had eviction in 20 years on their record. That's how long eviction stays on your record unless it's a sponge, unless you actively sponge. I used to be a housing advocate, and what's so sad about housing court is that it feels like the judges are hypnotized by landlords who have expensive lawyers and the families who are mostly poor and low, in low income and, and PIPOC Minnesotans. And a lot of them are single women, I mean single mothers, are coming there not even knowing what the process is 
before they know it, they have an eviction on their record. Permanent punishment for a one-time or inf infrequent issue should not hunt tenants. A fiction that's three years old, old or more should be sponge. That's common sense. At some point, we need to stop holding people, uh, people's past mistakes or situations against them. Loss of an income, loss of a roommate, financial emergence. Eviction hurts families. Eviction is one of the top reasons why people are homeless. Eviction costs us money. Proper housing saves lives. Madam Speaker and members, I urge a green vote on this imperative legislation to help thousands of Minnesotans stay housed. Thank you. The member from Douglas, Representative Franzen. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. You know, I remember uh, when I first bought my, my very first house back when I was starting out and it was in St. Cloud was where my first house was. And I was married at the time, commuting from St. Cloud to Minneapolis, where I held my corporate job. And uh, my husband was commuting to Alexandria, where he, where he has um, his job at a, at a local lumber, lumber yard. Anyway, uh, that was kind of a big deal, because I never really honestly thought that, you know, I would be able to get a home and I just remember the day that we signed the papers. Now this is just before the, the housing crash. So we bought, um, we bought before the, the housing crash in 20, 2005, I think 2004, I think that's when we bought our first house. So a few years before the crash. Uh, anyway, I just remember being so excited the day that we signed on the dotted line and it's just, I, it's just a memory that I'll never forget. We eventually sold that house and then moved to Alexandria due to the fact that gas was simply just becoming too costly for us to both be doing that commute. Besides, we had a little baby who was going to daycare in Alexandria at the time, and it was just, it was just not a cost efficient for us to stay in, in St. Cloud. So we sold that house we made zero money on it. We were just lucky to break even at that time. We had only been in there for like 19 months or so. And then we, we bought this house in Alexandria. Now this is when, kind of reminds me of what we're going through uh, this time with the housing market. There's very limited supply. So I kid you not, my husband was driving around and this house went on the market uh, and it hadn't even been listed for a day. And he said, Mary, this house is on the market. Uh, I think we should look at it and put an offer in. So we put an offer in that day and it was kind of one of those bidding wars and we, we did get it, but this was really seriously before the, the crash. So I think we got into this house at, in 2005. And so we bought high and you know, still, I just looking back and thinking to myself, I can't believe we have this house so nice. It was a, it's a beautiful neighborhood. I still live there. Um, but fast forward to today, I am very concerned about the future of my children, their friends, all of our children, really. Um, will they be able to own a home? And right now, housing costs are out of control. My, my ex-husband still works at that same lumber yard, and he keeps me apprised on the status of, of pricing as well as uh, many contractors in my district. Right now, we're looking at OSB was $9 before the pandemic. It's now $35 a sheet or even higher. In some places of the country, it's over $40 for one sheet of OSB. Lumber prices are up over 300% over the past year, which is extremely concerning. You know, the home ownership is the key to wealth. It is the key to financial prosperity. It is also uh, the main key driver of wealth. And so I, I, I think about what's happening in our, in our country, in our state with the costs 
of housing right now, uh, these bidding wars that are going on, a house will go on the market and they'll start bidding up ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 more than what the house even appraises for simply because people are, are eager to, to get into a home, to be able to own, own that piece of the American dream. So I was kind of saddened to see that nothing in this bill addresses those issues, addresses the issues of, of, of lowering the cost of being able to get into a home of their own. You know, renting is great for, for many people. Many people are happy to be renters. Some though, they really just wanna be able to own that piece of property. As I said, to be able to um, have that uh, little piece of property that they can build for their wealth, for their retirement. So members, I hope when this goes into committee, there can be some sort of agreement on how to address these issues. Granted, uh, it is probably not the purview of the legislature to start mandating the cost of lumber and OSB, but certainly there are things that can be done to lower uh, the costs in other areas uh, as, we, as we look into this very important issue. And with that, thank you for your time, members. The member from Sherburn, Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, this is an interesting conversation. I've heard a lot from many people. I'm uniquely uh, positioned because I do this stuff. I, I work on homes. I, I, I I fix homes. Actually, I remodel a lot of homes. I make them better. Uh, I make them more efficient. I make them cleaner. But I think a lot of people don't understand what, what makes it so expensive. And, and um, that's part of the concern that I have is to understand how it gets so expensive and why it gets so expensive. And a big part of it is, um, Many mandates, many municipalities, uh, permits, um, and, and the like. Uh, after I was elected in the beginning, um, there was many, many building officials that had reached out uh, that had concerns to the permitting process, and because that's very clear, um, it cannot be you know, overcharged. It must be fair and commensurate to the. the service provided. And I don't think a lot of people understand that or don't know, perhaps, that for all the costs that are put upon um, the developer as well as the builder, they pass it on to the home buyer, which they finance. And when they finance that, it, it, it doubles or triples depending on the interest rate. And, and it's a big concern. And then their tax base is based on that as well. Oh, by the way, so is their homeowner's insurance. So we keep having this conversation about lack of affordable housing, but nobody actually wants to deal with any of this. Uh, what we're actually doing as a state, and not me so much, but others, um, we keep pushing more costs. We have so many costs coming forward in so many different um, committees. Um, whether it's uh, local government, whether it's energy, whether it's uh, all of them, two or three dozen times, we have additional things. It's only 20 bucks, it's only, or I should say 50 bucks or a hundred bucks or 500 bucks or you know, $2,000, $8,000, $10,000 even. That's all it is. But we're gonna ask them to finance it. Young buyers, Maybe first-time homeowners. You know, if you're not aware, as of 2018, over 30% of the homes in Minnesota that were for sale are over $425,000. As of late, um, my neighbor bought his house for, I think, $289,000. 
2013 or no, maybe 15, whatever it was. Put it on the market for 4.95. Yeah, well, 25 offers later. I think it came in at 5.25. How, how do we have affordable housing or why well, why do we have a lack thereof? Um, I think the state actually gets in the way of much of it. And a big part of why I'm here. Because we we tend to get in the way. We think we're the cure or, or many do when we are actually the problem. And you know, lumber costs right now, extremely high. Yep. That'll fix itself once we get back to normal. Um, hopefully soon. But labor, uh, tough one. I don't know. Education keeps pushing kids not to get in the trades. Uh, we'll work on that too. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the bigger problem is what never goes down would be the state regulated fees, the, the, the taxes, the, the regulations, the license mandates, all the stuff that is put upon all of us that actually do it. If you look back just to, to five or six years ago, maybe, maybe seven years ago, there was a third more contractors than there are now. Why? It's a serious question. Because they got out. Some retired. Some join with others, but here we are. So we have a lack of labor. We have a lack of, of product right now. We'll get past that. But we also have to get a lack of government. Get out of our way. Let us do what we can do because uh, those of us that know how to do it, we can do it well. I, and, and I thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. The member from right, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Chair, uh, Chairwoman Hausman, Representative Hassan, Representative Abaje, Representative Her, Representative Ryer. I truly believe uh, your comments. I truly believe uh, you have a passion and have a good will, a good intent to help struggling homeowners, to help struggling renters with the cost of housing. But here's the fact regarding this bill. There is nothing in this bill that addresses the systemic cause and root cause of the housing crisis. Nothing in this bill, nothing addresses the systemic problems of the housing crisis. I come at this from multiple perspectives. I'm a housing provider and I have been for many, many years. I am a real estate agent. My wife is a real estate broker. She has her own brokerage. I'm a licensed building contractor and I'm a former city council member before I was uh, uh, elected to the Minnesota House. So I have the experience and as I have been listening here to the great speeches, I've taken down many different bullet points. On the multiple offers right now, wearing my real estate agent hat, there are multiple offers and I cannot overestimate how serious this issue is. It's the, the law of supply and demand. And so there are, it's not just, as we've heard a couple speakers now, 10, 15, 20,000. There are some multiple offers that are driving up the price by $50,000 over list price. And buyers are doing everything they can to come out on top. And one of the things that, that they are doing is making their offers non-contingent. Uh, you have cash offers that are uh, uh, winning out over lending you have people, buyers that are making offers without a, an inspection contingency. And members, so you can imagine a scenario here, purchasing a house $30,000 over list price without it being contingent upon an inspection. So there could be serious problems with the house. It could be mechanical, there could be 
uh, water problems with the roof. I mean, it could be a whole host of issues. And here you might have a scenario where somebody barely, by their fingertips, they reach up and they can barely afford that house by having to drive the price up tens of thousands of dollars over asking. Then they might suffer a, an issue three months down the road that costs them uh, thousands of dollars more. And it might put them in a financial bind. So one of the things that I look at uh, continuing uh, as a real estate agent and or putting on my hat as a, as a building contractor, I really appreciate the quality of housing construction, architecture, and the materials used. And I grew up in Northeast Minneapolis when my parents uh, lived out there and then in New Brighton. So among the neighboring cities there on the, the St. Anthony edge of Northeast Minneapolis, the cities of St. Anthony, Columbia Heights, Fridley, New Brighton, many of these houses, Columbia Heights, for example, uh, many of the construction, much of the construction out there happened in the, the 50s, the decade of the 50s. Much of the construction throughout the city of New Brighton occurred. The development of New Brighton was approximately the decade of the 60s. And then when I drive through East River Road in Fridley, one of the things that really uh, uh, gives me uh, a goosebumps actually is how large the lots are. Look at the lots in Fridley, look at the size of those lots. Fridley developing approximately the 60s and the 70s. Looking at the construction of Columbia Heights and New Brighton, it was the norm back then to have hardwood floors. It was the norm to have stucco. Today, hardwood floors, stucco siding are considered extreme upgrades because of the price. So when you compare decades ago, large lots, not having a, home, a homeowners association and the, the types of building materials that were used to today. Today, as Representative Hurtas was uh, articulating, developers have to pack in these houses like sardines on 0 0.15, 0 0.2 of an acre. And then it's vinyl siding, it's, uh, you know, materials that are, are not the upgrade, builder grade cabinets, builder grade flooring. Uh, you know, when it comes to the paint quality, it's flat paint versus uh, eggshell, summer gloss, right? I mean, these things matter. And so we, we need only look at the lot size, the density, uh, and the materials used as a barometer over the decades when looking at these neighborhoods and when they were constructed to see the consequence of government mandates. By the way, just to reiterate, there is nothing in this bill that addresses the systemic cause of the housing crisis. The systemic root cause is government mandates. And this bill only exasper exacerbates that problem. It makes it worse. Government created the problem of the housing crisis, trying to use the tax code, trying to use other incentives to engineer outcomes that government bureaucrats and government uh, politically expedient politicians have tried to manipulate over the decades. And then as it is unwinding and creating more problems, those are coming forward with additional answers saying that government is the solution. Government caused it and now government is gonna be the answer and that is not going to make anything better. When I put on my hat of a city council member, I am thinking uh, uh, the developers that came in uh, and we would examine the, the ideas that they would bring forward and their proposals. And one of the things that I learned as a city council member was uh, for those cities, right, out here where we are, where we are a growing city, we have many uh, fields yet, much uh, uh, rural areas, and that is changing. But what has to happen is compared to those cities that are mostly or fully built out, like Hopkins, like Golden Valley, like New Brighton, 
right? These areas are fully built out already, but comparing that to our, uh, out here in our uh, parts of Minnesota, as a city council, we have to put together our comprehensive plan looking forward 30 years. And one of, just one of the variables that we have to take into consideration when building these comprehensive plans is the number of parks that we wanna have. So when we're composing this comprehensive plan, 30 years that we have to update every 10 years, we're looking at where do we want parks to exist? Based on the number of parks, the square miles of parks in total, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a computation that occurs. Well, how much is it gonna cost us through the, the next 100 years of, of a city fully built out to achieve those number of parks? And that's in part how park dedication fees are derived. And so it makes sense for those cities that are turning from rural to having housing development go in, right? Park ded dedication fees being charged based on the number of lots, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things, just one example of how government is interfering with the free market and naturally occurring lower prices would be, I remember it was a couple of years ago, I believe it was when Republicans uh, first in the house here, we just got into the mi minority, which would have been maybe three years ago then, if my memory serves. But I was astonished at the proposal that the city of Minneapolis came forward and they wanted to change state law to allow them to charge park dedication fees on redevelopment. Well, members, that is the complete opposite of what park dedication fees are supposed to be for. Again, using the scenario of having a city that is in the process of being built out and a park dedication fee being charged to those lots that are being newly developed, right? Their contribution, each lot's contribution to a fully built out uh, uh, square miles of park citywide. Well, Minneapolis is fully built out already. And so they are simply double dipping by charging a park dedication fee again on a lot that's already been developed, a teardown's occurring and a new house is being built. That is just one example of how government interference is causing prices to continue to increase by double dipping and charging more fees, which in turn just get passed on to the eventual uh, home buyer of that. Another point. Representative Hurtas about, spoke about tax capacity. Members, I just wanna submit this for your consideration and see how these unintended consequences have impacts downstream. And what we're living in right now is going to permeate several years into the future. So there is an, uh, we have the eviction moratorium. We have the shutdown of bars and restaurants over the, the past year plus. And this has caused the value of commercial industrial property to decrease. So a building, a commercial building's value is determined, unlike residential property, the, the method to value a commercial property is based on how much revenue it can derive. And because uh, much of the revenue in commercial industrial properties uh, is by the tenants, when you have shutdowns of bars and restaurants, for example, that means the landlord is not able to charge rent. And then uh, when it comes to the tax valuation time, because the landlord was unable in the case of 2020 to collect rent for three months, 25% of the year, that has an impact on how much revenue was collected. And therefore it's gonna have a detrimental impact in the tax valuation that occurs in January of 2021 for taxes payable in uh, the year 2022. So in the, in the year 2022, because there was a decrease in the value, the tax value that was con uh, 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 calculated in 2021, well, guess what happens? Guess where most of our school districts achieve a significant amount of revenue from? Commercial industrial property. And so with commercial industrial property going down because Governor Walls mandated those buildings to be shut down in case of bars or restaurants, that's gonna have a consequence on school funding several years into the future. And then it's gonna take several years to come back uh, for the commercial industrial property. Uh, another example, uh, you know, Representative Franzen was speaking about how, uh, how uh, just the, the, the gleeful moment it is when closing on a property. I remember, remember when I bought my first house, April 13th, 2000. 
I was a truck driver at the time, and I believe my wage was, I think it was 14 bucks an hour. And I was able to afford my first home, myself and my wife. $14 an hour, and the home at the time that we purchased out here in Dayton, $133,500. Three bedroom, one and a half bath, tucked under garage on 0.35 of an acre. No homeowners association. On a cul-de-sac, by the way. What a happy time. When I drive around today now, 20 years later, and I'm looking at these new developments, 0.15 of an acre, starting in the mid 300s, right? So that means 350. Starting in the 350s, homeowners association on top of that, 0.15 of an acre. How does somebody afford that? And nothing in this bill is going to solve that. Nothing. And with the prices going up, we have a homestead exclusion here in the state of Minnesota. But that homestead exclusion has a cap. It phases out. And I don't know what the exact dollar amount is, but my memory serves it somewhere around the, the 600,000 time or a, a dollar amount somewhere in that neighborhood. And you can imagine how, if starter homes are at 350, Right? It's not too far to get to that phase out of the tax exclusion, by no means wealthy. You know, Representative Scott spoke about helping tenants. My wife and I got into becoming housing providers at the last uh, housing crisis, when prices went down. And we did not have, for a number of years, we did not have a single tenant who applied, or a prospective tenant who applied, who had not undergone either uh, medical complications and had uh, bills uh, and, and poor credit due to that, had undergone foreclosure themselves, and potentially even bankruptcy. Not a single prospective tenant had a, a good uh, credit score, not a single one. But you know what? We were willing to help people. And that is the vast majority of housing providers across the, the state of Minnesota willing to help, as Representative Scott articulated. We want to do everything possible to help good people who lost their homes or otherwise got into financial difficulty for no fault of their own. But the, the bill like this that fails to address the systemic problem of the housing crisis, which is government mandates, is not going to help housing providers like myself and my housing provider colleagues provide safe and uh, uh, market low naturally occurring affordable housing. It's not. This bill is going to make it worse. Then lastly, if Chair Hausman would yield for one question. Chair Hausman, will you yield for a question? I will yield. She will yield. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, uh, Chair Hausman. So, Representative Munson brought up a really good point, something I had not considered in regards to the service animals versus the support animals. So in your bill, beginning on line 28.11, it, it speaks about service animals and support animals. And the definition in your bill of service animal makes a reference to uh, federal regulations. So I looked up what the definition of a service animal is per the definition in your bill. And as I look at here, it is a dog. That's it. It is only a dog. Well, then I look at your bill. You have a new definition here for support animal. And so my question for uh, Chair Hausman is, is in, under your definition of support animal, do you have any specification of what species animal that might be? Are there any limitations? Representative Madam Hausman. Spe Madam Speaker, I would like to yield to Peter Fisher, the author of the bill. Representative Peter Fisher, will you yield? Yes, I will yield. And I assume you heard the question for Representative Lucero. If Representative Lucero Rep could repeat the question again, Okay, please. Representative Lucero, could you please repeat the question? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Fisher. My question is uh, regarding the definition of support animal. Uh, it, the, the section in the bill is quite lengthy, but could you confirm or deny that there is any specification as to what species a support animal may or may not be. 
Representative Fisher. Thank you. The species is left over this open. This was something that was common agreement between the renters and legal aid and a number of other people and the land, uh, landlords associations to come up with a way to address the issues that were facing people. We want to make sure that there was proper documentation out there to make sure that there was an official way for people to be able to meet the criteria because it's not always a dog. It's not always a cat. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And that confirms my high degree of concern. It's wide open as we just heard. Whereas federal regulations, they have the wisdom to define and limit a service animal as a dog, a support animal now is simply any, anything that provides emotional comfort, gives warm fuzzies. And so that could be a pig. You know, I know somebody that has a, a pet pig. And I love it, but as a housing provider, I would not want a prospective tenant to apply that has a pig living in the house. Because under the bill, I will be prevented as a housing provider from denying them. I have to treat them uh, no different, nor am I able to charge any additional pet deposit under the definition of support animal. It could be a peacock. Right? I've heard of these examples of peacocks coming onto airlines as their support animal. It could be a ferret. I do not want a ferret or a, a support iguana in my house. But if I do allow that, I want to be able to charge an additional pet security deposit. I have no idea what damage a, an iguana can do, but I do know that iguanas climb up the walls and they, they stay on the on the uh, the curtains, the ferrets, right? I don't know where they, they go. You know, my brother had a, a hedgehog when he was younger. I don't want a support hedgehog. But if, if I were to permit that as a housing provider, I want to be able to, to charge a pet deposit. So I don't care if your hedgehog or your porcupine or your peacock gives you the warm fuzzies, you know, you're gonna to have to pay a pet deposit for that because of the damage that might occur to my property. So, Madam Speaker, we need to address the systemic problem of the housing crisis, which is government mandates. This bill does not do that. We need to do that. We can do it, and we should do it. We can get government out of the way. We can help bring naturally occurring affordable housing, naturally occurring maintaining of lower rents. We can do that by reducing these government mandates that are increasing the cost of housing we can end the systemic problem of housing crisis, government mandates. Please vote no. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Howard. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank uh, Chair Hausman, the members of the Housing Committee, uh, as well as community members that testified uh, this session and helped form what is a strong bill to address a crisis that looms large over our entire state. Uh, members, this is one of the very first omnibus bills we're going to take up, and I think that's incredibly fitting given how central uh, housing, the ability to uh, be safe in your home, is to all aspects of your life and all aspects of our work to build a better Minnesota. And so I'm going to ask you to, to dream with me a little bit about a future in Minnesota where every single uh, person has access to an affordable place to live. And I want you to think about what that Minnesota looks like and how that would impact our work in our other budget areas. If it's helpful, just, just repeat after me. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Okay, you get the idea. Imagine in this Minnesota that every child knows where they're gonna sleep tonight that no families are going to have to move school districts in the middle of the year because they've been evicted? What would that look like as we craft an education bill and try to reduce the opportunity gaps in our schools? Imagine that in this, in this Minnesota, after paying their rent, every family has enough. Enough to buy groceries, enough to pay for their medical bills, enough to pay for expired tabs. In this Minnesota, would we be safer? Would we be healthier? Would we be happier? Imagine a Minnesota where every worker 
could live in the community they choose and have a job. How would that affect our economic competitiveness? How would that affect our local economies across our state? Okay, we can take off our ruby slippers now because that is not the reality in Minnesota. The reality is for hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans, 500,000 of Minnesotans, 500,000 Minnesotans struggle to afford their homes. And the problem is not getting better, it's getting worse. Despite a greater focus here at the legislature, the forces that be are making this a worsening crisis in our state because we're simply not building enough housing to meet the demand. We're not preserving the housing that we do have. Um, rent is driving up faster than incomes and has for decades. It's one of the reasons that in 2019, we had a 10% increase in homelessness. 10,000 Minnesotans experienced homelessness homelessness in 2019, and that was before a global pandemic. And as members have stated, we have one of the worst uh, gaps in home ownership equity in the country. 77% of Minnesotans who are white own their homes, just 25% of black Minnesotans own their homes. This is the reality, but it doesn't have to be. We can build a future in Minnesota uh, and we have the solutions to bear to build a future in Minnesota where everyone has access to a safe place to live. And this bill takes important steps in a myriad of ways to do that, to build more homes, to preserve more homes, to uh, provide stable housing for Minnesota renters. Uh, members, I do want to respond to a few items that we've heard uh, from the other side of the aisle. Uh, we heard a lot about um, the, the plight of landlords or housing providers. Uh, I don't doubt that some of those challenges are significant, but I want to, for a moment, help members put themselves in the shoes of rent payers in Minnesota. There are, right now in Minnesota, 150,000 renters who pay more than 50% of their income on their housing every month, at the first of the month. So please, put yourself in their shoes. Imagine that. Imagine uh, writing a check for 50, 60% of everything just to have that roof over your head. Everything else, uh, paying for uh, groceries for your families. Maybe your uh, child has a student project that you have to go to Target and buy some supplies. I had to do that uh, th this week. Maybe you have an unforeseen medical bill or you miss a couple days of work. Uh, and of course, over the last year during this pandemic, it's those Minnesotans that have been hit the hardest. The Minnesotans already paying over half of their income in their rent uh, were mo most likely to lose their jobs and are most likely to still be behind on their rent. Those are the Minnesotans we're thinking about in this bill when we take steps uh, to balance the relationship between landlords and uh, renters. And uh, it is a way to build a more fair, more just Minnesota. The other thing I want to comment on, uh, we just heard from a member that said the sole issue affecting affordable housing is government and government regulations. And um, I, I do appreciate that when Representative Nash talked about this, he did mention that it's, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Um, but uh, for many on the other side, it, it would seem, uh, to me, the analogy that I draw, it's as if you bring your car in to the mechanic. It's got four blown out tires, the engine is shot, every window is broken, and your, your mechanic comes back and says, here, uh, we fixed the air conditioning. Here's your car, you fixed it. Members, we have a significant challenge facing Minnesotans. The key investments that we're making in this bill are focused on the Minnesotans most in need. We are not going to solve this problem without making significant investments in housing. We need to be in yes and mode. Yes, we need to invest uh, in public housing. Yes, we need to incent the private sector. Yes, we need to preserve our naturally occurring affordable housing. Yes, we need to look at uh, some regulations. Uh, we need to be in yes and mode uh, to meet this moment. Uh, and so that brings me to, to my close here. Um, you know, uh, this bill includes $30 million in new investments in housing, and that is important. But I want to call out and remind you uh, that that is 0.3% of our entire state budget. Uh, remember back in the beginning of my speech talking about the impacts of housing on education, on health care. 
can we really say that 0.3% is going to meet the needs of our state when 500,000 Minnesotans can't afford their homes? And let's be clear, our budget here in the House is far better than that of the Governor. It's light years better than that of the Senate. But as we look at this issue long term, I really want to challenge this body to understand that whether we're uh, trying to address our racial disparities, improve student achievement, grow our economy, all roads lead back to home, and we need to do better. And so I'll close with just one more movie reference, this one a little more obscure. Um, I don't know if any of you all remember the movie Mr. Holland's Opus with Richard Dreyfus. A few head nods, I'm probably dating myself a little bit. Uh, in that movie, Richard Dreyfus is a music teacher, and uh, his school is cutting the music department, uh, and he's before the school board passionately making the case for his music department. Um, and the uh, school board chair kind of raises his hands and says, you know what, we're, we're doing our best. And Richard Dreyfus uh, sh uh, shouts back, you know, well, your best isn't good enough. Members. I truly believe that this bill is our best work, but if we want to build a future where all Minnesotans have access to affordable housing, our best isn't good enough. Not yet. Because there is no place like home, and we shouldn't settle until that dream is a reality for every Minnesotan. Thank you, Madam Chair. The member from Stearns, Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, I want to thank Chair Hausman for her work on the committee, also for Representative Howard. Um, you, we all have the same passion for housing. Sometimes it's in different areas, but we still have that passion. I want to thank you, and I also want to thank um, my team on the housing committee, uh, Representatives Bliss, Heinrich, Farr, and Jurgens. Thank you so much for your time, for your help, and for making this a priority for all of us. This bill does make some key investments, and I'm very grateful for those. But it misses the bigger picture and concerns with housing. Our housing costs are too high, and we have not built enough homes since the Great Depression. We lost many of our workforce who went to take other jobs and never came back, and our rising generations are going to have a harder time becoming homeowners. That will impact every corner of our lives. What is not in this bill is a glaring lack of policy designed to remove barriers and lower costs of housing for manufactured homes, new housing so our neighboring states do not benefit from our high costs and for remodeling existing homes for rental or private use. We see long-term policy that creates wedges between folks, between our housing providers and tenants. We are seeing slower growth in Minnesota. Do you know why? We could lose a congressional seat over this. We need to create more housing, period, for communities like Roseau, who's trying to keep Polaris and DigiKey. Crookston needs housing for their administration and staff at the college. How many seniors do you think we're, tr we're trying to have natural occurring affordable housing? That means seniors need to move. But I'll tell you what, buying a patio home starts at like $250,000. That is incredible. I have been contacted by folks in my district and others stating that they are not finding folks to work and they do not have the housing they need to have them to be part of the community. We need to get government out of the way for housing to grow. Leases are private contractors in the state of Minnesota and government rarely gets caught up in the middle of these transactions. Why now? We need to emphasize the opportunities to strengthen the relationships and see what is possible when all of us work together. People want to have options to create opportunities for themselves. We need to change that trajectory. We're going to spend time during the interim going through the governor's task force on housing, and by that I mean my team of GOP uh, folks who are on the committee, and we're going to draft legislation that benefits our housing needs and industry. We need to do a deep dive into what is being done and what is not to stabilize our housing market. The house, right now, the hard costs of building a home have been triple plus. Oxford alone is increasing five bucks a week. We're seeing less growth in Minnesota than our surrounding states. It's time to hold our agencies, counties, and cities accountable for the added costs and to be focused on housing and people, 
and families. And Leader Doubt, this is for you, because I need to talk about this, because I love housing. In St. Cloud, this is something that I received from one of our realtors the end of March. New listings, 133 in February, which is a minus 16% change. Active listings, 132, which is down 60% from the year before. A month supply, we have 0 0.80, which is a change of minus 62%. This is disgusting. Pending sales, 137, which was a 6% change. There is not the inventory out there. Right now we're looking at lumber prices, un unprecedented spikes to more than 24,000 to the price of an average, average new single family home. That is unbelievable. And yet we, we have bills and we're passing things without thinking about what the re repercussions are on the housing market. I've gotten numerous emails from realtors concerning House File 718, which is authorizing cities to adopt certain pest pesticide control agencies, which include treating homes for termites and things like that. How are we supposed to fix things when we can't even use products to make sure that we're keeping the houses safe? And then we heard a little bit about the bill today when we were talking about legacy. We had Chair Hansen's 1733, which basically takes SWCDs out of the Clean Water Fund. And you're asking, what has that got to do with anything? Well, what it has to do with is his plan to create more revenue is to add 50, $25 for each warranty deed and mortgage transaction. Now, you might think that's not a lot of money. And in fact, one of the, the members of the committee said, I just closed the house. What's another 25 bucks? Well, I'll tell you what's another 25 bucks. We just refinanced our loan a year ago. The closing costs for just refinancing were $6,168.79. Now you're putting another 50 bucks on it because all of a sudden, Chair Hansen decides he wants to take SWCD, SWCDs out of the Clean Water Fund and finance it that way. Really, folks? His answer to this was, it costs money to own land in Minnesota. We have a ton of duplicate permit fees. And we haven't even talked about that, and yet we're saying it's not part of the problem. Then why does it cost $50,000 more to build a house on the east side of our state than it does in Minnesota? That is a problem, folks. We're not going to have affordable housing. We're not going to have rentals because people can't afford it. And then we want to say, you know what, I realize that for some people, they can't afford 50 percent, I mean, their, their money goes to 50 percent of their rent. What do you think it does to landlords when they don't have people paying their bill? How do they keep up with it? I told you before, where, all, where does all the money go? It goes, lastly, to our housing providers. This is something we need to seriously look at. We need to look at what the costs are. We need to look at how are the bills we pass affect housing. Because your first thought is, it's not going to. And I'm going to tell you, yes, it does. And everybody should be concerned that Minnesota is growing slower than everybody else. That is an issue, folks. One we got to look at. When we start losing congressional districts, why aren't we looking at what's going on? And what's going on is we don't have enough folks building homes. We don't have enough folks willing to work. We don't have enough folks who are going to say, you know what, I'm going to go back to work. It's time now. We just don't have them. Housing should be the first thing we think about when we look at some of these legislations, but yet all I'm hearing is, oh, it's not really the problem. I'm telling you, yes, it is. I have been in this industry for 30 years. I was president of my Central Minnesota Home Builders. So was my husband. We had been involved for years and years and years. And these are things we've been talking about for years and years and years. I was president in 2009, and this is part of what our issue was. We're at 20, what are we in now, 2021. That's a heck of a long time of doing nothing but saying it doesn't count. 
We need all housing. It doesn't matter. We need housing, period. And we need to start building it today. Thank you. Further discussion? To the author of the bill, Representative Hausman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's late. Um, Representative Howard summed up the bill's issues and the challenge so well that I will simply uh, say thank you. First of all, to Mary Mullen and Chelsea Griffin in House Research, who worked diligently, to Ken Savory, our fiscal analyst, Blake Wilcox, our committee legislative assistant, Harry Maracle, our Republican researcher, Jennifer Nelson, our DFL researcher, Owen Wirth, uh, the committee administrator, and the members of the committee, many of them you heard from tonight, who have worked uh, to, to uh, get us ready for uh, tonight's work. And finally, advocacy groups and individuals, hundreds of groups and thousands of individuals who have worked tirelessly for several years and they never give up. They work hard and they have been the best partners that, that I could possibly ever um, want. So thank you to everyone and um, I uh, look for your green vote. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Those that are voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of those members who haven't voted yet? Better call my name. Just a second. Off. Baker. Baker votes no. Baker, no. Berg. Berg, aye. Berg, aye. Davids. Davids votes no. Davids, no. Daphne. Daphne votes aye. Daphne, aye. Eklund. Eklund, aye. Eklund, aye. Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Franzen. Franzen, no. Franzen, no. Grossel. Grossel. Grossel, no. Grossel, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Hassan. Hassan, I. Hassan, I. Hausman. Hausman, I. Hausman, I. Heinrich. Heinrich, no. Heinrich, no. Kiel. Kiel, no. Kiel, no. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, aye. Katiza Watoon, aye. Lily. Lily, aye. Lislagard. Lislagard, aye. Lislagard, aye. Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Marquardt. Marquardt, aye. Marquardt, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Pearson. Pearson, no. Pearson, no. Pryor. Pryor, aye. Pryor, aye. Sandell. Sandell. Sandstead. Sandell, aye. Sandell, aye. Sandstead. Sandstead, aye. Sandstead, aye. Sundin. Sundin, aye. Sundin, I. Thompson. Th 
Thompson, aye. Thompson, aye. Wolgamot. Wolgamot, aye. Zhang J. Zhang J, aye. Zhang J, aye. The clerk will close the roll. No. There being 69 ayes and 62 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.